It's now 10.45. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Welcome to the Stopwatch Session 3, Faculty Re and Researcher Services. I'm Athena Hefner, and my role here is going to be playing an obnoxious sound at the end of 6 minutes and 40 seconds. This is the sound that we tend to play. I don't know if y'all can hear that. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> um, each speaker will have six minutes and 40 seconds to present. Traditionally, with a Pucha Pucha style, it would be 20 seconds per slide, but we're not in person that, so um, people can use that time however they feel is best. And with that said, we're going to go ahead and get started with Adventures in Streamlining Research Data Services with a uh, I have a terrible at names, so Brianna and Dosh. Yeah. And then after each session, we'll have one or two questions while we switch between speakers. So, uh, my name is Brianna Dosh, and this is my session Adventures in Streamlining Research Data Services through the looking glass of an academic library data services team. Um, so to give you context about who I am and kind of where this story starts, um, I'm a social sciences data librarian at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I'm a first semester faculty librarian, which has been its own journey and adventure. Um, in addition to my data librarian role, um, I'm also a liaison librarian to the psychology department. And this story starts as me being the newest addition to our newly formed research data services team at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And what we're in the process of doing is we have a data curation librarian, me, the social sciences data librarian, and our STEM librarian, who have kind of, kind of all been doing our own thing with data services. And we're working on becoming an organized team of data librarians so that we're able to provide comprehensive, cohesive, and dynamic data services across disciplines. So that is a big ask. And so I'm gonna talk you through what I'm gonna talk about and how we're covering our approaches with this process. So first I'm gonna talk about what I mean when I say research data services. Um, that can mean something very different uh, depending on what discipline you're in, what institution you're at, um, and kind of your disciplinary goals. Um, and so I like to clarify kind of where we stand and where RDM, research data management, falls under that. And I'm also gonna discuss the challenges involved in becoming a team of librarians after kind of doing our own thing. And also the strategies and assessments that we are in the process of employing and planning on employing in order to get us to where we want to be. And so what do I mean by research data services, at least for the University of Tennessee Knoxville? Um, I like to talk about RDS as finding, extracting, collecting, cleaning, organizing, analyzing, and presenting data. What I like about this definition is it gives you kind of basic verbs that can be used to apply to more complicated terms. And that when you say services, research data services, rather than just research data management, you're able to touch all the parts of the data management life cycle and data life cycle. And so that's the way I like to look at it. Um, these are examples of things that we figured out that we're already doing um, in our own little ways as data librarians with data discovery data mining, things like that, and we know that there is more that we can be doing, and that's what we're hoping to figure out where we want our suite of services to really expand to. So here are some challenges that we've been running into as we've been trying to turn ourselves into a dynamic, cohesive team. So first, we all have different levels of data confidence. We're all at different points in our careers where I'm brand new, our data creation librarian is tenured, our STEM librarian's kind of somewhere in the middle, and we all have different approaches to and technical skills when it comes to data. We also came from different definitions of what RDS means, and so negotiating that and figuring out what our priorities should be. And there's also been um, different levels of interest in the value of working as a team when we are trying to, when we have some established services and some unestablished services. So that kind of leads to kind of the institutional silos we've been butting up against, where we're three librarians across two different departments, and so that makes communication difficult. We also have a business librarian who has already has an established suite of data services for her researchers, 
and she is interested in being a part of our team, but not at the cost of interrupting anything that she's already established. In addition to that, outside the library, we have the Office of Information Technology that provides data analysis help, and they have yet to view the library as a partner of data services. And so our biggest problem also is we really don't, we're just at the tip of the iceberg what, when it comes to what campus needs are, actually are with research data services. And so as we're figuring out what we do and what we want to provide to the university, these are kind of our plans of how we're going to figure out what the rest of that iceberg is. And so these are our planned strategies and assessments that we're working on right now that are in progress. First is we've decided it would be helpful to analyze things that we already collect, that we already measure. Um, we have a really great public services team that handle a lot of our reference questions, and not all of those questions related to data make it to us. And so we're working on getting IRB approval to analyze the chat tra transcripts and reference transactions and seeing what people are already coming to the library for with their data needs in mind. We're also pre preparing to do an environmental scan of campus. So right now we're reviewing the literature because there's no reason to start from scratch because there are universities that have already done this. We're planning on building on previous campus-wide assessments. We have a pretty robust assessment team in the library that sends out sur surveys rather frequently. So we're working with them. And we also have a plan to customize by discipline. I'm not going to ask the physics department the same thing about the data needs of our environmental data, our environmental equipment. Um, and lastly, we have some internal changes in the works. We're hoping to hire a digital scholarship librarian that could expand our suite of services. Um, we're in the process of hiring an additional business librarian to kind of bolster that. We have a large business department, and we know that we can kind of tap into their data services needs. And also, we've realized the importance of having our own house in order before we go to external uh, stakeholders to see if we can partner. And so we're trying to have these um, foundational conversations that we can move forward with the Office of Information Technology, for example. And so the way I like to look at it is someone who's brand new and we're trying to find RDS, a little progress is progress. And even though we haven't <coughs> yet to figure out the whole puzzle of campus-wide RDS, we're hoping that by this time next year, these assessments and strategies will get us where we want to be. All right, thank you. Okay, we have time for one or two questions while the next speaker gets their slide deck up. So is there a larger um, library administrative directive to get data services together? Um, yes. Um, so we have uh, one of our associate teams. When I was hired, she was very much like, hey, you have data in your in your title. Let's work together with other team members to see what we're, what we're doing. Because we have questions from different places on campus, like our Office of Research and Engagement, about what data services we provide. It's kind of like, we don't know. One more question? Okay. Are you all set up? Okay. So next we have reshaping and rethinking library services to structure campus conversations with Eric Resnitz and Nolan Davis. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully you can hear us fine. So I'm Melvin Davis, University Library at Coastal Carolina University. Alongside Hi, Eric Resnitz, Head of Instruction Services at Coastal Carolina. So what we operate this machine. So what we uh, set out to do was actually a listening tour uh, so we could find out what it is exactly that our faculty, uh, support departments, and even students across campus uh, think about the library and how they interact with the library. Uh, we are a sort of semi-small university of around 10,000 students uh, up in the way here in Pearl Beach. And so we were um, excited to find out what we could find from our community of users. Now, you may ask yourself, why would you undertake such an endeavor to, again, reach out to every department on campus because this can potentially be a very long and complicated process. We thought there were several reasons. One is the timing was right. I was uh, fairly new to my position. I've been there for around a year before Eric came on the board. And so through our discussions and sort of our efforts to reshape not only the library services in general, but in particular Eric's area of instructional services, which includes, of course, uh, liaison activities, we thought it was a good time for us to do this and to undertake this type of, uh, this type of endeavor. 
we also felt that there were probably some perceptions or misperceptions out there about the library. You know, we've heard rumors perhaps that there had been negative interactions with the library in the past, and so we wanted to sort of uh, suss those out and find out what we could from our folks. In addition, we felt that we wanted to establish solid relationships. Again, from both of our perspectives, this is important to our future work. And we, thinking ahead, with thought of to align our services, our technologies, et cetera, as we move forward and to prioritize with the help of, again, faculty and other staff across campus. Finally, last but not least, uh, we're in the process of building an additional building which will connect to the library and then also potentially a uh, re reworking, re-envisioning of the current library. Uh, interestingly enough, when we decided to undertake this, uh, this was not really something that was 100% on board. We thought we might have like one room in this new building, but as things have progressed, we now have a whole floor and then again, we're going to be able to hopefully redo the rest of the library. So we mentioned listening tour, but if you look at the title, we mentioned structured conversation. And when I think of listening tour, I think of something very open where in my ideas I go into a room and just listen. And knowing faculty, as many of you do, that can be problematic. And because we didn't want this to become, I mean, for lack of a better word, a bitch fest about things that go wrong, university things. So we, what we did was we combined a um, semi-structured interview process. So we're still listening, but we went to the table with a set of questions where it went to our goals. And we gave faculty leeway, and we also have partners as well, to give us different information, which we did use to um, change questions for some of the populations as well. Yeah, I mean, as Eric said, here is the question set that we actually used for faculty, which is the group we started with first, and we, we try to be very flexible in our approach. Uh, so what we would do is contact, say if it was a department, we would contact the department chair and say, here's what we want to do, uh, how can we work with you to make this happen, and sometimes we would find that we would meet solely with the department chair. At other times, we would meet with the entire department. So it really kind of varied. So we had to be flexible, especially in our time. So I think we asked initially for around 45 minutes. Uh, so we thought that was sufficient time to get these questions in. And then we found that some departments were like, well, maybe we have 15 seconds, or 15 seconds, 15 minutes that we can fit you into a department meeting. And then some department meetings lasted for over an hour, and some were solely engaged on what we were we brought to the table. We should say that uh, one of the things we learned through the process is these questions, we had to have the ability to reframe them uh, if we were, for example, working with uh, other departments. So results. We're still in the middle of the project, but we have talked with enough entities that we have a decent data set at this point. So the first thing is, if we look at participation, with academic departments, we've reached about 80% of academic departments on campus. And we plan to revisit, or at least ask the other 20% in the spring semester. With our campus partners, thinking student success and student life, we're also about 75% there. So those are the entities where we have um, talked significantly with them. We talked to one student group at this point, and we want to increase that, and we have not talked with administrators at this point, but plan to. So some of the themes. The first theme was books. This was consistent with academic departments. We would talk with them, and the first thing they would talk about is their small discretionary monograph budget each year. Consistently first. It's not that we weren't doing other things. We have a robust instruction program, lots of reference services, but that's the first thing they thought about. The next one, but hey, there's a cat. <laughs> so in the box, thinking was very much in the box. We came to the table thinking there would be lots of ideas for new things that we could do that faculty wanted us to do. We didn't see that at this point as we expected. So maybe we had too high of expectations. But we think a lot of led from the last thing, which for those of you under 30, this may not mean a lot to you, but there's a culture from the library of just say no. And prior to both of us coming here, a lot of new projects that were brought to the table, library administration told them no. And so that really has led to 
faculty that don't think of necessarily new ideas for us because they're used to it not happening. And so next steps beyond um, talking to new departments, uh, also reframing culture as well. We did not change the nature of that of that set of six. We we might have reframed the questions a bit, so they were still asking the same themes, but depending on the population that we were focusing on, we may have reframed it a bit or ask only certain aspects of the question, knowing that for this population we expected for them to talk about that more. <coughs> but generally, that may be as true to that set as we could throughout the process. Yeah. Did you do like any kind of qualitative analysis later on? I mean, you probably would have talked about that if you had more time. Yeah, I, I did run out of time. I've done some initial um, text analysis to look at some of the themes. And for right now, that part of the research I'm not seeing the broad themes that we saw here focusing on culture being in the box, those were apparent across the um, departments, but thinking about were there things that they consistently talked about, usually the books was the only thing that's come from that analysis at this point. per semester um, to, and we dedicate that semester to working with that department or those two departments. So that was a picture of my colleague and friend Jennifer Corbin who is our director of public services. I'm Debbie Dinkins, I'm director, um, sorry, associate dean of the library and I handle all the tech services side. So this is just some data uh, that we collected to see who we were actually reaching, student-wise and faculty-wise. And what we were trying to do is we had an influx of new faculty in the last three or four years, and they all had research library expectations from a small library. Undergraduate FTE at the university is about 3,000. And we don't have these kind of budgets, and we don't have the ability to nimbly just start a database on a moment's notice, usually in August when the fiscal year starts in July. So uh, we wanted to manage their expectations of us in terms of how we could fill what they needed, um, how we could help them with the services for them and their students and how we could serve their needs much better. And we've never had a liaison program at the university uh, library. Uh, I've been there 26 years and we've never had a liaison pro program during that time, but we have informally and through the instruction processes built collaboration with some of the departments on campus. So we decided to build on that and, cre and um, intentionally create a collaboration with two departments a semester. And we started back in the fall, um, and we went with very friendly departments that we already had a good relationship with. We started with English and marketing, 
And um, it was interesting what came from that. We went in and we just gave them a list of all the collections and resources that we had to support them and their students, and we gave them uh, a list of the services that we thought would support their students. And then we had a conversation. We usually ask them to carve out maybe 10 or 15 minutes from their departmental faculty meeting. And uh, we had a conversation after they got that information and went ahead and looked at it before the, before the meeting. So, uh, the services side, we were hoping that they would realize that our instruction program could help them come up with interesting research assignments. Um, we could help them structure their syllabus in terms of putting a word in there about what the library would provide with research consultations and um, ask the librarian type functions. And they were all very receptive to that. And they did not realize <laughs> that we offered uh, such specialized uh, programs, as well as you know, live guides for particular courses or live guides for a particular major. They had no idea that we offered that kind of thing. So, as this shows, uh, in fall of 2018, we started with English and marketing. One of the outcomes from English I thought was really interesting because on the collection side was. Uh, they wanted us to buy the text that they were teaching. And we <coughs> usually say no to textbooks unless they're um, some kind of open source thing that we can get from them. But uh, they, of course, wanted novels and poetry collections and essay collections, and I was more than happy to buy those for them. So every semester, I now have a reminder <laughs> in my calendar to contact the English department faculty and ask them what, what uh, what text are you teaching in the next semester? And that's worked out great. Um, for marketing, we found that uh, they really wanted help for their students with their marketing plans by providing a libguide that gave them state and local statistical sources. Um, and if you've ever done a marketing plan, you know that's, that's a big part of what you need with demographics, with uh, local data about healthcare or education or whatever. So we built that quickly, and um, the students also came to us asking about help with their marketing plan because the faculty were happy to ask them to go talk to us about it. So then we went to the School of Music. Um, we didn't have much success there. They were happy to have us come talk to them, but they didn't use us very much. So that was kind of disappointing. Um, in the summer, we moved on to the online faculty at Stetson University, where I am at, in Central Florida. They, um, we only have online classes, except for a few graduate programs, in the summer. So we sent generalized information about collections and services to the faculty that were teaching online. And again, we had very little access. Right. So then this fall, we're working with um, digital arts, and we're working with uh, sociology, and we've had some interesting outcomes so far, um, but we're still in the process of working with them. <coughs> Success for us, we think, looks at, again, managing those expectations. This is what we can give you, but maybe we can't give it to you immediately. Um, awareness of our services with research consultations and just building that collaboration of being in their space and talking with them has been a huge plus. So thank you. Hey, wonderful. Do you have any questions for me? Debbie, I know you have a small staff, but based upon your work so far, have you been considered not having officially assigned liaisons to departments? Uh, we have looked at that over the years that I've been there, back and forth. Um, we've got eight librarians, yep. and I don't know how many departments, um, quite a few. But the level of expertise of our librarians when it comes to collections, I would say, is, is very. Some of them are very specialized, some of them are very general. And we all, because we're small, wear two or three different hats. You know, I'm associate dean, I'm the systems librarian, I'm running tech services. So uh, adding the liaison part, other than informally, uh, hasn't been viable for us. But we're hoping that the librarians, when they see the success of this project, will want to be part of it. So it might grow organically.
six million syllabi aggregated. Any additional questions? All, all right. Not, and moving on. Next, we have collection and research services for the independent scholars surveying the landscape and filling the gaps by Melissa Gaspar-Rafa. All right, can you hear me? Okay. So, um, so I was really interested in this particular group of researchers because there is a pretty significant gap in service to those who have no uh, academic or institutional affiliation. And the New York Public Library is fairly well positioned to support them um, as they move in and out of academia, for example, and really act as that constant service provider as they, um, they uh, move in and out of institutional affiliation periodically, for example. Um, so the group in, of independent researchers includes everyone from the recently graduated to advanced researchers working um, outside of academia, for example, research analysts, to journalists who rely heavily on current historical resources, um, to public historians, and so on. It's a fairly large group of people who don't get served by academic libraries. Um, and since NYPL is a large combined branch and research institution, um, we serve all information served by needs for all comers. So I set out to understand how we currently tackle that kind of service and then how we can build upon it. What I quickly realized is that you absolutely have to start with staff with possible building and housekeeping, just like any new initiative. So I developed a set of trainings and pressures to make sure that staff are well aware of all of our collections. Um, referral programs, consortia, um, our enhanced borrowing programs, and I ended up training over 100 librarians, um, very large, and that's just the research side, that's not the brand, um, in uh, understanding ILL, collections access control workflows, as well as lesser stood <coughs> the shares program. Um, this is just an example of some of the material I put on the internet. Um, that alone improved the quality of government services that we were able to provide across the institution to those who lacked only other access but NYPL. Um, just briefly, I want to mention that we have a, a level of access for every type of researcher who comes to our doors. So all patrons get that exact same card, but the privileges differ depending on the residence, um, your research need, uh, et cetera. So anyone in the entire state of New York can have a New York Public Library card. Um, we can send them by mail who live outside the metro region. Um, and the typical card, the three-year card and the three-month researcher card, both come with database access remotely. So you can see how we can serve the independent researcher across the state of New York uh, very easily. Easily, but there was a big problem about um, providing information to those folks. We hadn't really undertaken any promotional initiatives to tell statewide researchers that they had that kind of access. Um, we also have a temporary card, uh, which allows you to prepare for your research visit in advance. It allows you to place requests for physical items, but really crucially, it allows you to place a request for electronic document delivery for an article or a Dutch article, so they can really prepare by the time uh, you get to us. So another way that I've started pulling together a service plan for independent researchers is by approaching our entire website as a global service um, that can facilitate the whole discovery to delivery process. We've done a lot of work to clarify our public-facing documentation on preparing for your visit in advance. Um, we've also tweaked a lot of staff-facing workflows to handle permissions and reproductions requests more efficiently um, for researchers who are local. Um, we, oh, we um, strategically work with vendors to um, digitize collections that might be low digitization priority for us. Um, and then we get those files back, and after an embargo, we can get them So, like all research libraries, we're part of a number of collections and access consortia. One of these is um, monitoring. Um, this provides a group for independent researchers to get access to and borrowing privileges from our local. <coughs> And NYU. Um, at NYPL, we used to approve researchers by an online application form, but I really felt it didn't provide us with the opportunity to engage with our projects and meet them um, and make sure that they knew about our collections and how they could meet their needs before sending them off to our consortium partners. So this year, we started providing access to this borrowing program uh, during a consultation in person at the library. So we've really begun to understand the independent user a little more um, deeply. And I'm hoping that next year, once we have a full and consultation process for this year, We'll understand uh, we'll have more insights and how to further develop our services for this particular population. Um, our core services to researchers also include application based study room. Uh, admission, we just opened a whole new center for research in the humanities in the, the flagship building, Lion. Um, 
they just had a spa day and they got cleaned by the <laughs> um, um, So this uh, center expands our ability to serve those researchers with space and to services. Um, so for example, the Independent Scholar has nowhere to go for scholarly communications workshops. So now we do that. So I run a whole series of soft workshops for independent researchers. We really are filling that gap in the ability of the researcher. Um, another way that we serve unaffiliated researchers is by supporting open source and open access. Um, that's not necessarily the rationale for entering into that space, but it certainly does impact them positively. We have this gap, if you've not um, yet seen it. Um, it's called Simply E. We developed this to provide access to um, a consolidated, to have a single experience across a lot of our EU uh, packages. All libraries can adopt this. It comes preloaded with OA content, and you can integrate with your own uh, licensed resources. I think there are hooks for certain types of packages. It doesn't include all of them, but definitely look into it. We support that. There are five. And then future initiatives. Some of these are very, very beginning, <coughs> further along. Um, we are. Uh, we have a new research division called the Digital Research Division. Uh, that's a central unit for um, thinking through a variety of possible initiatives, including understanding what we need to develop a virtual reading room to serve our collections, um, what we look like to offer remote fellowships to deliver our services um, to those at a distance. We have a new Center for Research and Learning that's going to be under construction starting next year. We're thinking about offering distance education opportunities, of uh, working with institutions across the distance to co-teach special <coughs> collections that can't necessarily be moved. <coughs> on in the next year or so, um, and then we're working with the Library of Congress to understand what our combined circulation data might say about future um, digitization needs on a national scale. So um, you can see that we're working every day. Um, not all of these things are designed specifically with the independent researcher in mind, but the position of NYPL itself as a standard research institution really does lend itself to seeing our services in that light. Um, I think we still got a way to go to make sure we're comprehensively supporting those who don't have a current academic affiliation. But I think it's probably pretty clear that the way forward is definitely to leverage our consortial agreements and the digital <laughs> Questions for any of the presenters? Well, let's see in a half time. I'll save, let's save outlay. <coughs> or you have five extra minutes to go where you go. 